one pill that God has somehow forgotten. That you are faced with circumstances you can't get through. Right now it seems there's no way out and you're going under. But God's proven time, time and to get uh, where we uh, encourage our singers a little more. Those singers do, a, they work and practice. I can tell they've been practicing on that song and uh, did a beautiful job. Every once in a while, just while they're singing, you know, there, there's not anything wrong with just letting that. I'm not talking about drumming up something artificial. I've been in some of those churches where <laughs> I've told you about some of those places where they, man, they get... They get excited. If it's real, I'm all right with it. But I, I've got my doubts about some of them when they start running and swinging on the chandeliers and jumping in the baptistry and doing cartwheels down the center aisle. I'm not sure if that's, well, I just know which spirit it is. <laughs> but I think, I think we get our hearts blessed sometimes. Listen, see if I'm right about this. I think we get our hearts blessed sometimes, but we're afraid to let anybody know. And uh, there's not anything wrong with just saying, Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, okay, I can tell some of you looking like a calf looking at a new gate. Turn over to Hebrews chapter number 13. I, I've got to do this. It's, see, it's cost you two sermons tonight. See what you cause? <laughs> uh, chapter 13 of Hebrews, I, I go through this about once a year or so. I'm, I'll remind people about this. You know it's there. You've read it, but I just like to remind us. 
Um, in chapter 13 and verse number, we'll start at verse 13. Let us go forth, there, let us go forth therefore unto him, Jesus, without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Now, we shouldn't be too concerned about this old world or who thinks what about us in this old world. Now look at verse number 15. By him, therefore, Jesus, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Now, praise is a sacrifice. Just like the Old Testament saints, look up here. Just like the Old Testament saints would go to the tabernacle and, and they'd take a bull or a, a lamb or a turtle dove and they'd sacrifice that animal on the altar, show of devotion and obedience to the Lord. Uh, that was a sacrifice in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, we don't put those animals on the altar, but he says that the praise of our lips is a sacrifice. Now let's read on. He says, that he is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The fruit of our lips. He tells us don't forget about that. Don't, uh, don't forget to employ that one thing that you have that you can sacrifice. You can, you can be broke and not have a penny to put in the offering. I've been there. And you? <laughs> there have been times when I was, I was broke as a convict. I mean, if somebody had broke in our house in the middle of the night, I'd have to get up and help them look to see if we could find something, you know. But I might not have any money to put in the offering, but I do have some praise on my lips and that doesn't cost anything and so when somebody's singing or somebody's giving a testimony and amen it might not have to be a shout it might have nothing wrong with that it could just be a quiet amen praise the Lord isn't that good isn't God good and just offering up the praise to the Lord now see, when we believe this, when, when somebody's singing or somebody's preaching, it's not a performance in our church. Nobody's performing, it's not entertainment. But we're, we're offering up, we're all doing our part to offer up our praise to the Lord, whether it's a preacher or a singer or a Sunday school teacher. Uh, we're offering up our talents and abilities to the Lord. And so if somebody's singing or preaching or teaching, the preacher or the teacher or the singer can offer up their praise of their lips, but then the congregation can also offer, offer up their praise from their lips and uh, and there's nothing wrong with that and so just a little encouragement now now go to Luke chapter number 5 and we'll see if we can uh, pick up where we left off this morning on our message uh, does anybody remember the title of it I can't remember that's why I'm asking you anybody know huh, huh? expectations and, and let's get a little more specific about it let's add a word to it you want to I I change sermons, I change titles, I change everything as time goes on. I never have completed a sermon in all my life. Never have. When I study for a sermon, I don't care if I've been working on it for a week. When it comes time to preach it, I'm, I'm usually still thinking of something that I'm going to change, a note I'm going to add, or something, a word I'm going to change. I'm, now, you don't do that with the Bible, right? The Bible is God's finished revelation. We don't change it. But, but I'm not God, and my, my sermon notes are not the Bible. I try to get them out of the Bible, but, uh, but, you know, I'm not like one preacher said. He said, I've got one of those note Bibles. Every other page is blank, so I can just write my own Bible. And I don't want to do that, but I'm changing uh, notes all the time. Never have got finished with a, with, with a sermon. I'm always adding stuff. to right, I've sat right over there a lot of times just... While somebody's singing a special, the Lord put something on my heart, and I think, oh, I remember that, that one point, and go back and change something or add something just to try to make it a little bit more complete. Now, I don't know. Maybe when I get to heaven, I'll get a complete sermon then. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just want us to uh, add this word, fulfillment, the fulfillment of our expectations. Because we've got expectations. We've all got that. But what we're looking for is the fulfillment of those expectations. And uh, sometimes we come to church, and uh, sometimes you've got a preacher that really doesn't know why he's there. I've got a sign right here on this pulpit. Uh, let me read it to you. It's John chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, I'm sorry, John chapter 12, verse 21. The last part of the verse says, Sir, we would see Jesus. And the reason that's there is because uh, it's to remind the preacher of everything else that's said, people need to see Jesus. I mean, preachers come and go. Churches come and go. But Jesus endures forever. And so 
when we preach, when we teach, when we sing, it always ought to be our desire that people would see Jesus. And uh, sometimes we come and the preacher doesn't know why he's here. He doesn't know why he's behind the pulpit. Sometimes we come and we're sitting in a pew and we don't know why we're here. <laughs> you ever come to church and wonder, why am I here? Uh, you may wonder about the preacher. Sometimes the preacher wonders about you. And uh, we just don't know. We don't come prepared. We don't have an expectation of something that God might do for us. We're kind of like the guy that went to the doctor's office and uh, walked into the, the receptionist and uh, <clears throat> said, I, I need to see the doctor. And she said, well, well, what have you got? He said, shingles. And she said, well, go back there in that room right back yonder, the room, first room on the right. So he went in there and sat down. And the nurse stuck her head in the door, and she said, uh, what, what are you uh, here for? He said, I've got shingles. She said, well, take your clothes off. The doctor will be in here in just a minute. And so uh, he took his clothes off and sat there. Finally, the doctor came in. He said, what have you got? He said, uh, I've got shingles. He said, well, man, I don't see any. Your skin looks as clear. He said, no, they're on the truck out in the parking lot. <laughs> now, sometimes we don't know why we're here. And uh, maybe, maybe the doctor doesn't know why we're here. But there ought to be a reason. Now, let's, let's pick up where we left off this morning. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and read that passage. It's short. Chapter 5 of Luke, verse number 16. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a, a bed, a man, which was taken with palsy. And they sought means. I like that. And they sought means to bring him in, and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, when they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst, of, uh, into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto, the, unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this? which speaketh blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon the earth to forgive sins, he saith unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, Take up thy couch and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Father, I pray that you'd bless us in this short time that we have to look into your precious and wonderful word. Lord, I pray that you'd amaze us tonight with your word. Lord, we're so glad every time you show up to be with us. It's so much sweeter when you're involved. And, and Lord, I wouldn't even want to stand here if people couldn't hear from you. And so I pray that you'd, uh, by faith, we just trust that you'd be here. And Lord, that you'd speak to us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we started out and we talked about this morning, we were in this, uh, in this little list of talking about things uh, that we could learn, key thoughts, key lessons from this passage of scripture, from this little story where the men carried this crippled man up on the roof of the house. They tore up the roof and let him down on, uh, on his stretcher into the midst of the room and the whole house just stood still and watched as Jesus first forgave him of his sins and then healed him. And so uh, right smack dab in the middle of the room, everybody's watching and they see a miracle happen. And so we see some lessons from this little story that can help us learning about fulfillment to great expectations. We said, number one, that we have to have first an interest in solving our problems. I don't know, I don't know how many people I've had to ask me over the years about some problem in their life, and I'd give them an answer the best I could from the Bible about how to go about fixing that problem, and they'd just brush it off and say, well, no, I'm not... I don't want to do that, or I've already tried that, or I don't think that'll work, or you don't know my case. You know what the problem is? They didn't have an interest 
in fixing their problems. Some people don't have an interest in fixing their problems. They have an interest in telling you about their problems. <laughs> have you been around people like that? I mean, I've had people come and sit in my office before and said, Pastor, I need some counsel. And they'd sit there for 30 minutes and just talk and talk and talk and tell me everything that's wrong in their life and then get up and walk out before I could tell them anything. I said, well, I guess I took care of that. <laughs> you know what the problem was? No interest in solving their problems. They just wanted to talk. And then number two, we said that there has to be an involvement and an investment of time and energy. If there's going to be a, a fulfillment of our expectations, listen, there has to be an investment. There has to be a time come when we are willing to sacrifice time, effort, and even money if we're going to see our expectations fulfilled. Inconvenience and sacrifice are two key reasons why many Christians never accomplish anything for God. Are you listening to me? Some of you just missed that. Inconvenience and sacrifice are two key reasons why some people never get anything done for the Lord. You ask that, would, would you serve during the, during the family crusade? Well, I won't be able to, preacher. I've got, uh, I, bought, I bought a yoke of oxen I've got to go see about. <laughs> Could you stay in the nursery? No, I've got a piece of ground over there. Could you, uh, could you work on the van route? No, I can't. I, I, uh, I have a wife. I've married a wife. Well, bless your heart. <laughs> People don't want to be inconvenienced or get involved in sacrifice. We like to talk about what we want to do, but when it comes down to where the rubber meets the road, sometimes there's a little more to it, isn't there? You say, man, I didn't know it was going to take work. Uh, I didn't know to pray meant you really had to pour your heart in it. I didn't know that reading through the Bible was going to require 20 minutes a day. <laughs> I didn't know uh, that to be a faithful member of my church that I'm supposed to be there at all the services. Hey, I was reading just yesterday about a church, reading about a church, an independent Bible-believing church. They said, we have, we have, we have uh, uh, convictions and standards and requirements, and before people join our church, we let them know. Hey, we expect them to be there at the services. <laughs> and... Uh, Sometimes people just don't want to be involved. And doing things for Christ, seeing things fulfilled, expectations fulfilled, costs us something. And it may be inconvenience. It may be time. It may be money. Well, let's go to number three. Expectations. The, the lessons we can learn from this little passage of Scripture, how the fulfillment of expectations come. These men who took that paralytic man up on that roof used ingenuity and creativity to get the job done. Ingenuity and creativity. Sometimes we do we just do some new things. Some people think, well, I don't know why we why we have to do this, or I don't know why we have to have an anniversary Sunday. I don't know why we have to have a, a, a fellowship meal. I don't know why we have to have a fun night. We're against fun. <laughs> We're supposed to be sad at church, aren't we? Well, the reason we do different things is not because we had this bright idea that didn't work. Maybe sometimes it is. But if one thing didn't get the job done or if we've used one idea up we can always go to another to try to be creative to come up with some idea that will reach people we're thinking about uh, just changing our visitation process instead of saying all right we go out on Thursday night and Saturday morning visit people well if nobody comes maybe we'll try something different now we got some people that come I'm not saying we don't I appreciate uh, my wife and Miss Nell visits on the bus route uh, every week. And they begged me and begged me and begged me to let them visit on that bus route. No, they didn't. You know why they do? Because nobody was doing it. And uh, I'm glad they are. And we got some people that come out on Thursday night and go with us, Aaron and Erica, my wife, and Paul and Dee, and, and Miss Nell, and some others come out uh, on Thursday night from time to time, and, and we visit. But if we could get a bigger crowd to come and, and visit if we change things up and if we said, well, here's what we're going to do. Instead of having a, a 6 o'clock Thursday night visitation time, 
what if we just uh, what if we just give a list of addresses, say five or ten addresses on a on a three by five card, and just put them on a table back there and say, if you're willing to go out, pick up one of those cards and go whenever you want to during the week. And uh, you go to each one of those five doors or ten doors, whatever we however we decide to do it, and uh, you you carry a uh, an invitation card and a gospel track and you go knock on those five doors sometime during the week. It could be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whenever. But you just go and do it at whatever time works for you. Now, if we got more people going that way and making more contacts, if we had if we had twenty just say twenty people taking and and, and they, they teamed up. 20 people teamed up into 10 teams, two by two. And uh, each one of them took a visitation card that had 10 addresses on it, 10 addresses in a week. Uh, and if we had 10 people to do that, how many contacts is that? Let's see. Huh? 10 times 10 is 100. Now, there's your math lesson for the night. <laughs> you can take that to McDonald's and Walmart and teach those cashiers that and make a lot of money off it. <laughs> and uh, so we'd have 100 contacts just off of those 10 people who made 10 visits apiece. That might end up being a lot more contacts than is being made the current way. Huh? You say, I'm not so sure it would work. Well, if it don't, we'll try something else. <laughs> I mean, we're not locked into anything. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how to go about doing visitation. It just says go into the whole world. So as long as the whole world hasn't been visited, we can go pretty much anywhere we want to, anytime we want to, and do it any way we want to. And so ingenuity. These guys had to get that paralytic man into that house where Jesus was, and it was not an easy task. There's people all around the house standing in front of every opening to the house, and they can't even get close to it, uh, much less get a stretcher through the door. So what do they do? They scratch their head for a minute and say, now look, if we can't get in the house, it would really be difficult to dig under the house, but we could go up on top of the house and come down that way and get right in the middle of everything. And so they got them a plan. And they went up the stairs, dug up the roof. You say, well, that's kind of uh, involved, digging up the roof. <laughs> I don't know if they went back and fixed it later or not. I suspect maybe the Lord told them, now, guys, we got him saved, now go back and fix the roof. I don't know. It doesn't say. But the point is this. They got creative. And we can get creative. You can get creative about how you reach your neighbors for the Lord. You can, uh, you can take them some cookies over there and say, hey, we just want to bring you over some cookies. You might not even, uh, you might not put a big uh, push on to got, try to uh, get them saved that night or get them in church that night. But then you go back and you just befriend them and go back and go back and uh, Make friends with all your neighbors. Maybe that would be a creative way to do it. What do you think? Well, they were creative. And then number four, they had insight and irrefutable faith in God's ability. Now let me ask you a question. When they took that stretcher up on top of the house and they went to digging through the roof of that house, do you think that was just an afterthought or do you think maybe they had faith that something was going to happen? I believe they really believed that if they could just get to Jesus, something big is going to happen. I mean, what did they want to do? They wanted to get that guy healed. They came up with a plan. They had faith then that God was going to do something and when we begin to do something, it doesn't matter. I'd, I'd rather see somebody try something and fail a dozen times but they've got faith that God's going to do something than to sit back and never try anything. And so if we try something, it doesn't work, but we've got faith that God will do something and we can find something that works and we just keep on trying and we finally get people to Jesus and they get saved, then hallelujah, our faith paid off. I believe faith is what God blessed right here. Jesus saw their faith. Look at verse number 20. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. <laughs> faith. Faith. Have you got faith in your fellow Christian in church? Have you got faith in your church? Have you got faith in your Sunday school teacher, your preacher, the people that work here and 
and the fellowship you have with other Christians? Have you got faith in the people? I mean, we, we understand none of us are God, but we ought to have faith in what God's going to do through all of us together as a church. And uh, I believe in some people. Um, that, I said I went to the high school reunion. My wife and I went yesterday up to Mount Pleasant. And uh, by the way, I, I learned something last night, Brother Paul. This ain't got nothing to do with the illustration I was just about to give you, but I just happened to think. Sam Houston, for which the city is named. I was reading last night and discovered that Sam Houston had several brothers. One of them's name was John Paxton Houston. He was three years older. If I remember right, Sam Houston was born in 1793. John Paxton Houston was born in 1790, three years earlier. You ever heard of John Paxton Houston? He was famous just like Sam, except he was not famous for Texas. He was the first clerk in the first courthouse in Izzard County, Arkansas. John Paxton Houston. Now, how many of you knew that? See, you have learned something here tonight that you couldn't learn in any Calvinist church. You couldn't learn this in the liberal church. Only here can you learn about John Paxton Houston. <laughs> well, that's a true story. Now, what was I going to tell you before you interrupted? Huh? My, my illustration. What was my illustration? Oh, oh, up at the reunion in Izzard County, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have this memory problem. Sometimes I get right in the middle of a... Yeah. <laughs> well, I was at the high school reunion, and, uh, and one of the teachers, Oma Jean Brown, I used to work with her husband back in the 70s on highway construction up north. He worked for Cost Construction Company where we built uh, interstate highways. Newt uh, was a heavy equipment operator on the dirt crew. I worked on the concrete paving crew. But we'd see each other once in a while and uh, got to know him. But back before then, I was, when I was still in high school, his wife was one of my teachers in high school. And uh, this was before I became a Christian, and I was a little bit notorious uh, in those days. <laughs> and... Uh, so, uh, Oma Jean Brown sat down. I asked her if she knew me yesterday, and she, she finally remembered me, and she sat down beside of me, and, uh, and we began to visit a little bit. And, and uh, she said, uh, well, Rick, what do, you, what do you do anyway? I said, I pastor Liberty Baptist Church in Searcy, Arkansas. And she got this look of shock on her face. She said, you're a preacher? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you're a preacher? I said, yeah, and there's another lady standing there. She said, hey, would you believe he's a preacher? <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I kind of think maybe they had trouble of understanding that maybe God could do something with me. Now, I'm glad. They, didn't, they might not have had much faith in me, but when, when uh, I think Jesus looked down before I got saved, he looked down at Elvis Sneathern and said, Brother Sneathern, <laughs> There's a guy who lives over here. It's, uh, he's, he's a kind of a wild man, but I believe if you go over and talk to him, I believe we can get him saved. And so Elvis Sneathern, because God inspired his heart to come and talk to me, uh, Elvis Sneathern had faith in me. Jesus had faith in me. I don't know what I've amounted to, but at least it shocked them, and that was a good feeling of satisfaction. <laughs> we gotta, we got to have faith. What does the Bible say in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6? He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder to them that, what? Diligently seek him. He must believe that he is. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. These men who went up on that roof with that paralytic man had one key element that Jesus noticed. What was it? their faith how about faith what are we going to get done without faith if it's impossible to please God without faith are we likely to get very far on our talents are we likely to get very far on our education or our good looks or our popularity I don't think so without faith it is impossible to please him now there's obstacles they faced obstacles that day trying to get that man in that room where Jesus was we face obstacles today. Look, we, we're a church. We're individuals. But we face, indiv we face problems, obstacles today. What are some of the obstacles people face in having their expectations fulfilled? 
Number one, we have people problems. There's obstacles of people. Uh, Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. The fear of man. You know one reason that a lot of people never see their, their expectations fulfilled? It's because they're afraid of people. We're afraid of what somebody will think. We're afraid of what somebody will say. We're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of somebody's disapproval. I would rather try something and fail than never have tried at all. And, uh, and people, sometimes it's your own family. Isn't that true? Sometimes you're trying to do something for God. You're trying to see an expectation realized and fulfilled. And sometimes it might be somebody in your own family who tries to hold you back. It happens. Can I get an amen there? That's true. Sometimes it can be a friend. Sometimes it can be another Christian. Other Christians. I've seen ladies who wanted their husband to get saved before and then their husband got saved and sold out lock, stock, and barrel to serve Jesus and the wife was mad as an old wet hen about it. She wanted him saved. She just didn't want him that saved. <laughs> there's people problems. Then there's possession problems. Sometimes people don't serve the Lord. They don't see their expectations fulfilled because of their possessions. They've got something that they don't want to lose of material value. People will not get close to the Lord because the base of their happiness comes from things instead of God. And it's not just people who are wealthy. Sometimes it can be middle-income families. Sometimes it can be poverty-stricken families. Some of the most selfish people I've seen in the world are people on welfare. It's true. You don't have to have a lot of money to love money. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Matthew 19, 21 and 22, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that, that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, when, uh, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Perdition. Now let me give you the third thing that we encounter as obstacles today in seeing our full, our, um, what did I say, expectations fulfilled. And that's perceptions that are false. Sometimes people have perceptions that block them from seeing their expectations fulfilled, but they're false perceptions. I've heard things about our church. Uh, I've heard things about me that I didn't even know. <laughs> I've heard things about some of you that I didn't know. Now, I, I, I've heard some things about Brother Denny. I partly believe them. <laughs> see, you see where Al's at, don't you? He's moved all the way to the back. See, he's escaped, and he's left you up here alone. You see what kind of friend he is. <laughs> Obstacles that keep people from getting close to the Lord. False perceptions. Sometimes people hear things. Now this is, can I just give you something here? Just a little heart-to-heart -heart advice. When we're critical of each other, when we're critical of our church, oh, you don't have to say anything really bad. You, you know how you can just say it uh, in such a way where you don't really say anything bad, but you leave that impression that there's something wrong with him or her. I mean, there's something wrong with Al or he wouldn't have moved to that back row. <laughs> He's been picked on too many times. <laughs> it might be wisdom, brother. <laughs> but we say things. When we say things about each other or negative things about our church, do you know that that may poison your children? That may poison that husband you want to get saved? That may poison that wife? That may poison your friends. They hear you say something a little bit negative about your church, and they may not say anything, but in their mind they're thinking, yeah, I don't guess I want to go there. And we shoot ourselves in the foot trying to see expectations accomplished for the Lord, and we shot ourselves in the foot. Now, I'm not saying, hey, if, if there's something going on that's a great big scandal, we ought to deal with it as a church. 
First Corinthians chapter five teaches that if there's if there's out and out sin that's uh, public and and needs to be taken care of, then we ought to deal with it. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody enjoys that, but it ought to be done. But if we just got some little things that make us a little irritated, we ought not to air it out in front of other people. Learn to bite our tongue, keep our mouth closed, and because the will of God is that we try to get people saved, and if we poison the waters, they're never going to jump in the pool. Hello? Are you with me? It's true, isn't it? All right, perceptions that are false. Sometimes we just, some of these perceptions might not be based on somebody else's perception of us. Sometimes we have perceptions that are false. For instance, let me give you an example. <clears throat> when, uh, when the disciples had been fishing all night, Jesus told them uh, to get in the boat and launch out into the deep for a draw, for a draft. Uh, they were a little bit hesitant to go out there in the boat. They were a little bit hesitant to launch out into the deep. You know what that's called? That's the fear factor. Fear of failure. Sometimes we have a false perception. We tend to not accomplish everything that we could accomplish. We tend not to have our expectations fulfilled, not because of a competence problem, but a confidence problem. We don't have the confidence that God could use us. And He can. God can use anybody in this room. You say, well, you don't know my background. I don't care about your background. You don't know what I've been through. Don't care. I know God can use you. I know Peter, I know Peter cursed and denied the Lord standing around the fire, and God still used him. I know Paul persecuted the churches before he got saved killed people, consenting to Stephen's death, and God used him. Is there any worse sin than murder? And God still used Paul. <laughs> what about King David? King David committed adultery and murder. God used him. What about Abraham? Lied about his wife, almost let her commit adultery because of his lie, and God still used him. I'm not saying God wants to use us as we're sinning, but when we repent and get it right, He's still willing to use us. I don't believe God wants to put anybody on the shelf and leave them there indefinitely. I don't care what you've done. There's some people think that once you've done this sin or that sin, you're done. God won't ever use you again. That's a devil's lie. That's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. That's a false perception. The only time you're on a shelf permanently is when you choose to be there through a false perception. God wants to use As long as you've got breath in your body, as long as you've got a heartbeat, God wants to use you. And He can because He's God. He can do anything He wants to do. And that's my hope for being able to see expectations met because I know God is going to use I know I'm imperfect and I know I've got faults just like you have. But God can still use us because He's God. And He's not dependent on us. He's dependent on Himself. Amen. Isn't that good? Well, let me give you another obstacle. A passion for sin. Some people never accomplish anything, see their expectations fulfilled because they love sin more than they love God. You say, can saved people do that? Yeah. Saved people can love sin more than they love God. Why do you think Peter did curse and deny the Lord? He's capable of sinning. Why did the Corinthian believers act the way they did? They loved their sin more than they loved God at that given time. Now you can get back to loving God more. But if we choose to love our sin more, then we fail to fulfill those expectations. Uh, God wants us to get out of that. Let me give you another one. Prejudice is another obstacle. People who are prejudiced against the Bible or prejudiced against Jesus or prejudiced against Jews or pre prejudiced against uh, races or prejudiced against anything. People who are prejudiced have their mind made up. Voltaire, the famous, uh, the famous atheist. Voltaire said this. He said, if a miracle occurred in the marketplace of Paris and in the presence of 2,000 men, I would rather disbelieve my own eyes than the 2,000. You know what he's saying? He's saying, 
I have chosen not to believe God, and so therefore it doesn't matter what I see that tells me that God is real. I choose not to believe it. And he died and went to a devil's hell. That's how people can be prejudiced. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Well, let me give you these last things. And, and uh, the pronouncement of Jesus, big number three, the pronouncement of Jesus. Uh, chapter 5, verse number 20, And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. You know, the first thing he said was not you're healed. What was the first thing he said? Your sins are forgiven. Why did he do that? Because his paralytic condition was not his worst problem. His worst problem was he was lost and he sinned. And so Jesus took care of the first problem, a big problem, by forgiving his sins. And then because the Pharisees were looking on and said, Why, well, you must be a blasphemer. Nobody can forgive sins but God. You know what they're saying right here? The Pharisees are giving testimony that Jesus is admitting that he is God. Because only God can forgive sins. And then Jesus turns around and says, well, just as though it made a difference. I mean, if, if he could speak the universe into existence, he could heal a paralytic man. If he could speak the world into existence, then he could forgive sins. And so as though it made a difference what he speaks, which one's harder for God? None. <laughs> he can speak anything and make it happen. But just to show them that he was, he went ahead and... Uh, said to the paralytic man, you're healed. Make up your bed and walk. And he did. Uh, sometimes people have more faith in traditions and fairy tales and fables than they do in the Word of God. Well, let me give you, uh, let me give you the last, just the last two points. The, number four, the Pharisees complain. Uh, when the, One of the characteristics of the Pharisees or a modern day Pharisee is that they would rather complain than do something. Then there's a perception of Jesus and the performance of the miracle uh, in chapter 5 verse 22 through 25. He had the authority to heal and he did. You know Jesus knows your deepest needs of your heart. He knows about your expectations and he knows what you really need uh, there was a and, and the reason being is because he's a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities he came as God and as man he was fully God and yet fully man why did he come as a man well one of the reasons was that he had to experience what you and I experience if he wanted to be our high priest, priest that couldn't sense our pain. There's a story about Joseph Mallard Turner, who was an English English painter. And uh, somebody went in his studio one day and, and uh, saw a picture of a storm at sea that looked so realistic, that was so captivating. The man said, how did you paint such a realistic picture as that storm? And Mr. Turner said, well, I went to the coast of Holland and engaged a, a fisherman to take me out at the next storm into the sea. And he said, when we got out on the open waters waiting for the storm to reach us, he said, I told the captain of the boat to tie me to the sail mast, to tie me securely where I couldn't get loose, and under no circumstances was he to release me during the storm. And he said the, the winds came and the rains came and the waves come crashing over the boat and the lightning and the thunder and the fury of that storm was like nobody had ever seen and he was right in the middle of it. And he said when the, he said there were times when I just wished, he said the, the, the turmoil was so great, there was times when I wished the waves would just cover me and put me out of my misery. But he said I endured. And then he said when I got untied, I went back to my studio and I painted the picture of that storm. He said, I had to feel and experience the storm to be able to understand it and paint it. You know what Jesus did? He went through the storm for you and me. He's been through it. Stormy cross. He endured it for you and me. 
And so there's nothing we go through that he doesn't know about. There's nothing that we suffer that he doesn't sense the pain. And so he knows he's the one who suffered the storm for us. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. Lord, help us to realize our expectations. Lord, help us to rely upon you when we're in the storm. And Lord, help us to have faith that you can reach our expectations and fulfill them. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us godly expectations. Whatever the need in each heart is tonight, Lord, I pray that if there's some who are not saved, that they'd trust Christ as Savior. I pray that those who have had doubts about selling out lock, stock, and barrel to live for you, I pray that you'd give them the confidence tonight to know that it's not their efforts that will win the prize, but it's you just having faith that you will bring them through. I pray that you'd bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bent. Eyes are closed. Would you stand, please? Quietly to our feet.